Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for bearing with us there. Uh, I want to give you a big thank you for joining us today for this webinar on Australian Aged Care Quality Standards. Really excited to see so many of you making the time out of your day um, to attend this presentation. So my name is Josh Malta, and I'm the Assistant Secretary for the Choice and Transparency Branch in the Department of Health and Aged Care. So I want to kick off today by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the many lands on which we're meeting, uh, wherever you may be in Australia, and I want to pay my respects to elders past and present. Here today, I'm standing on that old country. I also want to extend a very warm welcome, very warm welcome, sorry, uh, an acknowledgement to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us here today on the webinar. So today I'm joined by Simon Christopher, the Director of the Aged Care Quality Section within my branch, and also Margaret Banks, who's a Director at the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare, who's been responsible for the development of the clinical care standards. We're also joined by Andrew Matthews from MP Consulting, and Andrew is going to help us do a great job by facilitating the Q&A session over the next two hours. We're also hoping to welcome our World's Name presenters here to help us communicate with you. So the purpose of today's webinar is to introduce you to a proposed set of strength and quality standards, including what is changing, why they are changing, and what's informed these changes. We'll give you an overview of the structure and role of the standards, how they apply to different providers and service types, and how they'll be assessed by the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. I say proposed standards because they aren't set yet. We do want your feedback in shaping these. We'll provide you with details of how you're able to continue to engage and provide your feedback over the next six weeks while the public consultation is open. Finally, we'll talk about the next steps and what happens once the public consultation process is complete. So there'll be three points throughout today's webinar. Um, and when we'll stop, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll check some questions, whether or not you have Q&A. So you'll be able to see at the, um, the bottom right there, at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, you can enter questions uh, for us to answer, and we'll try to do our best to answer as many of these as we can. Having said that, if we're unable to get to the question, we'll take a list of these and we'll put some Q&As um, up on the website. We'll also be recording today's session, so it'll be available online in a few days along with a transcript, so you and others who might not have been able to join us today are able to watch it again. So, why are the quality standards changing? The current quality standards were introduced in 2019 and set expectations to support the delivery of quality care. We appreciate that the aged care sector, particularly providers, have invested time and resources to adjust their systems and practices to meet the outcomes required under the current standards. So you may be wondering, why we are proposing changes again now. There's a range of drivers for the changes. These include responding to findings from the Royal Commission, feedback from older people who want to better understand what they can expect from providers, and providers who want to better understand what is expected, how they will be assessed, how the standards apply differently to different service types, and how this can better align with disability. One key driver of the change in standards is the regulatory reform work which is underway. That work contemplates a registration system for providers which better differentiates regulation in line with the risks arising from different types of cares and services. Another change is the government commitment to harmonise regulation across aged care, disability support and veterans care. The proposed structure, as you will soon see, better enables this approach. The Royal Commission highlighted that while standards are a powerful tool, they are not sufficiently comprehensive, rigorous or detailed. And the particular focus needs to be given to several areas, including governance, diversity, dementia, food and nutrition and clinical care. And it recommended an urgent review of the quality standards be undertaken by the 31st of December 2022. In response, government now announced the circuit review to ensure that they're detailed, measurable, relevant and easy to understand. And as part of this, government trans transferred responsibility for the setting clinical components to the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality Healthcare, who we have here with us today. As a first step to inform the urgent review, the department engaged KPMG to do an independent evaluation of the current standards to look at their clarity, relevance, and the impact they've had on quality. Comprehensive processes looked at an international and local domestic research and consulted with key stakeholders, including older Australians, providers, and peak bonds. 
We had nearly 1,400 participants complete online surveys. We also spoke to just over 300 stakeholders across 35 virtual focus groups. The process identified that additional content was needed in the focus areas, which was highlighted by the Royal Commission. And this formed the basis of the department's review. So, as I said before, the process focused um, across what those particular pain points were identified by the Royal Commission. It certainly confirmed that additional content was needed in those focus areas, and so that's formed the basis of the review and development of the draft strengthened standards. The report's available online for the independent review, and it's one of the resources which is supporting the public consultation process if that's something you're interested in. Additionally, the evaluation helped shape the current draft by, strive, by driving a stronger focus on the old person to ensure that the design of care and services orients around the individual. It also provided a focus that there was improved clarity around expectations and what providers can do to achieve this. But it also enabled some standards to be turned on and off depending on service time. It also enabled structural alignment with the NDIS practice standards while recognising the difference between aged care and disability services. So to develop the, the standards, the department has been working really closely with the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare, and also the aged care sector more broadly, subject matter experts, older Australians and their representatives to help develop the draft standards. We've done this by engaging with a consumer reference group, a sector reference group, the National Aged Care Advisory Council, and the Council of Elders. Since late 2021, we've been engaging critical friends and across the four focus areas of food, nutrition, dementia, and diversity. And what we did through those groups is ask older Australians and the sector what good looks like. So, it's important to recognise that the standards are just one part of a significant program of aged care reform, which is being delivered over 2021 to 2025. This includes the introduction of a new regulatory model set out in a modernised, person-centred and rights-based Aged Care Act, which will replace the current Aged Care Act and the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission Act and related subordinate legislation. The new Act will place older people at the heart of the system and support several reforms aimed at ensuring high-quality care and services for older people. It will be supported, it'll be supported by subordinate legislation and guidance to help providers understand expectations. Implementation support will be necessary to enable existing providers to understand the regulatory changes, including how the new Act and the strength and standards apply to them, how providers establish systems to demonstrate their performance, and further consultation will be undertaken on this in 2023 to ensure there's a bit of a purpose. While there's no decision of government in terms of implementation timing for the current standards, there certainly would be merit in aligning this with the new Act and also the new Support at Home Care program, which is scheduled for commencing in July 2024. Again, the standards are just one component of a range of regulatory requirements which are used to drive provider performance and protect older people. And these complement things like quality indicators, the serious incident response scheme. So performance against the quality standards will also inform the new star rating system which will highlight the quality of residential aged care services, providing older Australians, their families and carers with information to make choices about the care they receive. So let's pop through to the new slide. And here you can see the new structure, the great unveiling as they call it. So you can see here the intent of the standards is to place the person at the centre, enable alignment with disability and veterans affair. You can see we have a set of core standards, standards one to four, and services which is sorry standards which are specific to particular services across standards five to seven and as part of that we have a dedicated food and nutrition standard which government committed to deliver the current quality standards are outcome focused and comprise eight standards each including a consumer outcome organization statement and a number of requirements describing expectations of providers the structure of the revised quality standards has been adjusted to include for each standard an expectation statement for older Australians and their families that describes what they can expect from their provider in relation to that standard. 
but also includes a number of outcomes, each supported by an outcome statement, which is what the provider will be assessed against, and a number of actions which are how the provider might demonstrate achievement in the outcome. This structure allows for the inclusion of more detail to help both older Australians and providers understand expectations, whilst also improving the measurability of the standards. This is something we heard really prominently from providers. You can see really clearly as you navigate the new set um, that it comprises seven standards and it takes the standards from 42 requirements to 31 outcomes with 142 supporting actions. While this may seem like an increase in regulatory requirements, the intent is to provide more clarity on how you can achieve the outcomes which are already required by the quality standards. There are some new outcomes, again, particularly in the area of food and nutrition and clinical care. However, the majority of the actions recognise things that providers are or should already be doing in order to achieve quality care. The role of the quality standards under the new aged care system will be similar to that of the current quality standards. For older people, the quality standards will define what older people can expect from their aged care provider. Older people will be asked about their experience with their provider, and this will inform assessments of the provider's performance against the quality standards. For providers, they set out things providers need to be able to do to deliver quality care, and these will apply to most Commonwealth-funded aged care services. Providers are required to meet the outcomes described in the quality standards and demonstrate through evidence to the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission how they do this. Again, the actions provide better clarity on how. The revised quality standards will be supported by detailed guidance and other resources to be developed in 2023. So, feedback has identified that having the same standards applying to all providers can lead to over-regulation and under-regulation of some providers. As I said before, under a registration law, these new standards can be better applied based on service type. For example, we expect that most providers will be subject to the first four quality standards. Some providers of high-risk services, such as residential care, and those providing clinical care, will be subject to some or all of the other three quality standards as relevant to those service types. Providers delivering low-risk services, such as gardening and outside maintenance, may not be subject to the quality standards, but will continue to be subject to other requirements. This means that for service types, where there are specific expectations or risks, standards are being developed to address those specific risks. This approach has been further explored in a separate consultation on the new model for regulating aged care, which is being tested by a series of consultation papers. And I encourage you to go to the engagement hub to check those out, register and be kept up to date. So let's move to the slide on how the Commission will assess performance. Simply put, the outcomes are what providers need to meet and the actions are how providers might meet the outcomes. This will be tested through the public consultation process through a pilot to test a redesigned audit methodology. The Commission will invite a range of representative providers to participate, including consideration of service type, size and location and diversity of older people. The pilot findings will inform refinements to the standards, the audit methodology and the development of guidance for providers and older people. This will be developed in consultation with providers and consumers with public consultation expected to occur in early 2023. Further information will be made available on the Aged Care Commission's website. This work is really critical to ensure that the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission has the processes, the tools and the guidance in place to regulate the sector consistently and effectively and ensure providers are delivering safe and quality care for older people. In terms of key changes, so while the structure of the strength and quality standards has changed, the content and language have been drawn on the current quality standards. We're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And again, what we want to do is really emphasise those consumer outcome statements where we got really strong feedback from the current set. So these are retained and simply state what older people can expect from their provider. We've changed the language though, as we've sought to use words that senior Australians preferred. Additionally, key changes provide a stronger focus on the rights and outcomes for older people. For example, they highlight person-centred care and require providers to get to know older people, to orientate their care and services around what's important to them, 
and a rights-based approach requiring providers to respect and to support the autonomy and choices of older people in all aspects of their care. They also enable an increased focus on providers' governance and partnerships with older people, clearer expectations for providers and more detailed requirements across a range of a range of areas. For example, there's much greater detail on food and nutrition and also clinical care, which each have their own standard. So if you haven't already, apart from uh, indicating that there's issues with the sound, please enter any questions that you have um, and we may be able to take an opportunity to answer these as part of questions and answer. And answer. Andrew, would you like to, to facilitate this next part? Sure thing. So afternoon everyone, apologies for the sound again. We are in an auditorium here in Canberra, so we can't log in and log out again in order to adjust the sound. We understand that it's still a little echoey. We'll try to speak nice and slowly, but we'll also make sure that the PowerPoint presentation is available to participants. And if we need to re-record a session, um, we can also look at doing that for people. Obviously, there's also going to be follow-up focus groups um, that you're welcome to um, express interest in coming along to, and we can expand those um, depending on demand also. So a couple of things in relation to the questions. The panel individually can't see your questions. I'm going to be moderating the questions, looking at the questions and putting them to the group. So please keep them coming through the chat and I'll make sure I raise them with the group. A couple have come through already. The first one that came through, um, thank you very much to those who've been contributing questions. Josh, if you want to speak to whether or not the standards will be applied to multi-purpose services in the new world. No, not at this particular stage. So you may be aware that multi-purpose services at the moment are subject to, to standards developed by the Australian Commission on Safety um, and Health Commission. That's a mouthful. I don't think I've got it right. But at this stage, no. But the intent, I think, flows through is what I would say. So what will happen is once the set of standards have been finalised, we'll map this, the, the revised set, to the national standards and organisations will have to meet the national standards and the additional aged care standards. But we won't be able to do that until this process has been completed. We have a final set of standards. Then whenever there's an assessment of a multi-purpose service, it will be against the national standards and the aged care standards module. So continuing the current approach to multi-purpose exactly. services. Yes. We've also had a question about the extent to which this might um, these standards might align with the NDIS and how far we're moving towards alignment with these new standards. Simon, I might throw that one to you. Thanks, Andrea. Um, so these standards take the first important step in structurally aligning with the NDIS practice standards. We've um, been very conscious to make sure that, um, as Josh, Josh said, not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, we have been ensuring that the aged care uh, concepts and, and key uh, expectations remain within those standards. So there won't be a direct alignment, but the structure will be very similar um, and they um, will largely address the same concepts that the NDIS practice standards address. And again, this is kind of being mindfully done and being aware that a number of providers and workers are working across both areas. Related to that point, another question that's come through, Josh, is around um, people have picked up on your language around this might not, this won't apply to all providers, but will apply to most providers. Do you want to extrapolate a little bit more on that in terms of who it's expected the quality standards would apply to? Absolutely. So based on feedback on the current standards, providers would often tell us that they still seem residential focused and sometimes it was hard to see how certain standards applied to particular service types, particularly in home care and CHSP services. So what we've done through this structure, you can see standards one to four. Uh, it's envisaged that these would apply to the majority of aged care quality services with the exception of some lower risk services. So for example, gardening and maintenance, we may not have standards for at all, but note that there will be additional protections in place. Things like code of conduct, registration, the serious incident response scheme and the like. You can then see how these standards lend themselves um, through a modular approach to be applied through particular service types. So again, food and nutrition is envisioned to apply to only residential aged care, 
residential community, and then of course clinical care where services are providing clinical care. Now, there's someone online who I think has been around in aged care for as long, or if not longer, than all of us, because their question linked back to a 2005 inquiry around quality and equity in aged care, and they noted that back at that time, um, the standards were evaluated and determined to be too open to interpretation. And we've had a few questions from people worried about interpretation by the Commission. Can you talk us through a little bit, I'll ask you, Josh, and then Margaret, in relation to the clinical care standard, about what's been done to kind of improve the measurability and the certainty around the standards? Absolutely. So that's a, that's a great question. I imagine I know who may have asked that. But um, look, the, the set of standards we have at the moment are principles based. And what we've heard, particularly from providers, but also all Australians, is they're not actually sure what they can expect in a principles based um, approach. So what we've done is taken those outcomes at a higher level and added actions to it. So both providers and the community can have greater clarity around what the actual expectation is. And again, that also provides a better indication of how you're going to be assessed by the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. Margaret, did you want to add a perspective? Um, in relation to the clinical care standard, then um, it, it clarifies probably what people are, are doing now. And we would anticipate that greater clarity would come with the implementation resources because not every service is going to be the same and not every strategy that they put in place to achieve the standard will be the same. So it's an opportunity to say, this is what we want you to achieve, but there might be a number of ways to do it and here's some suggestions for you to do it. And this is the sort of evidence we'd expect to be seeing. So there's, um, there's a number of layers for organisations to pick the, the service type and the evidence and the strategy that meets the context and their, their clients' needs. And we've got a triple header question here for you now, Simon. We've got a couple of questions coming through about the timing. So when it's anticipated that the standards will take effect, whether there would be a transition period, and then what kind of guidance would there be to support providers and others around that transition and commencement date? Thanks, Andrea. I always love a triple-headed question. <laughs> it, um, uh, it's just to, to repeat the last part. But, um, but look, what uh, is being considered as part of the um, upcoming consultation, and there's an existing consultation paper, one which is out now, on um, the new model for regulating aged care, that will consider a number of factors um, such as the... Um, any transition arrangements that will occur for providers within the market now. Um, we, um, with quality standards, have been um, broadly aligning to both the new Aged Care Act but also the new Support at Home program. And we are aware that um, the new Support at Home program is currently scheduled for the 1st of July 2024. Um, it, would be unlikely these would start before that, but there's still a decision uh, for government. Thank you. And, so the, and yeah, guidance? Uh, the guidance. So there will be, um, uh, the Commission will be undertaking a pilot in the new year um, to test the standards and then also test what guidance will be needed to support the sector as um, it moves to an implementation um, phase, if you like, of the new quality standards. So um, as Margaret said, we'll, we're seeing the, um, the outcome expectations along with the actions which will detail how a provider might be able to demonstrate that. And then supporting um, those two uh, high-level pieces will be the uh, implementation and the guidance and resources that allows a provider to understand how that would apply to them or how they might demonstrate that. And I think going hand in hand with that would also obviously be work within the Commission to build their kind of capability and capacity to test against the new standards. Josh, there's a number of questions that have been coming up about how the assessment will be done. Will it continue to involve consumers, but making sure that people expressing concern that, you know, if one consumer has concerns about um, their experience in aged care, will that influence the overall outcome for the provider? So I think like we've talked about, we're anticipating that there continue to be very much consumer engagement and involvement in those assessments. But do you want to talk a little bit about what your expectations are around kind of the transition with the Commission to being able to assess against those standards, 
the further work that'll be done as absolutely. we start up standards. Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, I think you're absolutely right insofar as consumer experience will continue to be critical. Um, to understand, analyse, interpret, to work out from an assessment perspective where the standards are being met. Uh, in terms of what we'll be doing with the, the assessment methodology from here, so following the consultation process and we hear your thoughts and views, we intend to, to finalise a set of standards which we intend to present to government. Government will have to make decisions on that. And then it's really important that the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission pilots these standards to understand is it accessible on the ground? What are the types of evidence that providers are required to provide so that it can develop a really consistent and transparent um, audit methodology? So that's work, Andrew, that I will continue to expect into next year. And I think through that process, the, uh, the Commission will also be looking to engage with providers to develop their guidance. So providers are really clear on what the expectation is and also to how to develop the processes and systems and evidence how they're meeting the standards. And a number of questions are coming through about the pilot and people seeking confirmation, I guess, that the pilot will involve Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander providers, providers from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, that the pilot will also take into account the views of consumers and others. Do you want to speak to that briefly? Absolutely. So I think it's key that we have a representative range of providers. Um, I think that's come through really loud and clear. So diversity is out there in providers with industry. Um, and it's also around consumer experience to be able to tailor the approach too. And what I mean by that is hearing the consumer voice, whether it be through the consumer experience interviews or through the assessment approach itself, and finding out what good care really looks like from a consumer perspective so that can be built into the assessment methodology. Cool. And Simon, we've got a few more questions around the NDIS alignment piece, so I'll come back to you on those ones since um, you started us down that path. The question is, is this a first step towards alignment with the NDIS? And if so, what does it look like down the track? Will there be kind of further review of the standards or further alignment down the track? So I think... Um, uh, I don't want to steal any thunder from colleagues within the department. There's a body of work going in relation to the harmonisation that is um, uh, between what's referred to as the care sector being um, NDIS, uh, Veterans Affairs and um, aged care. So there, there is a body of work that's looking at, um, at how that work progresses. We've obviously were um, ahead of the queue, if you like, on our reform piece. So we've been mindful to make sure that um, this body of work supports the broader harmonisation approach. And, and again, it's that um, concept of harmonisation is further to be explored, as I understand it, in the upcoming consultation process that's um, uh, in relation to uh, the regulating, uh, the new model for regulating aged care. So um, I, I can't predict exactly what that'll look like at this point, but um, encourage people to participate in that process. Um, these would be the, um, the starting point from an aged care perspective to, to further that journey. And then there may be other work that looks at, um, you know, the, any uh, changes that may occur in the NDIS practice standard space in the upcoming foreseeable future out of, you know, the body of, um, Changes that may come their way from Royal Commissions and other reviews. Okay. Now I can see a number of questions coming up from people here about some of the detail of the standards and some of the detail, particularly of the clinical care standard. I will just hold those over to the next Q and A session, just because um, both. Uh, Josh and Margaret are going to talk you through the standards in a bit more detail and are likely going to answer a number of the questions that are coming up there. I think one question, though, Margaret, that I know is close to your heart in terms of a passion of yours has been around whether we can start making the shift from we appear to be going into darkness. Oh. <laughs> always... Earlier in the day... In fact, four minutes before the webinar started, we had drilling immediately above us, and so there was a quick run around to build with above, but now we have light again. Excellent. Thank you, Simon. Um, so the question is that at the moment, a lot of the, well, the comment is that uh, at the moment, a, lot, a number of the assessments and evidence that needs to be presented is paper-based, and can we be moving away from a more kind of paper-based way of evidencing requirements? And I was wondering if you could reflect on that even from the Health Commission's perspective, and the embedding of the health standards. Yeah, 
I, I believe that we do need to move away from the paper-based, not that we don't want people to document and we don't want evidence to be there, but the information and the assessment should be based on what's actually happening day to day. We want to see it in practice, not just see that somebody's written about it. So while there is uh, a requirement still to look at the paper to make sure that meetings have been held, that minutes have been actioned, um, and that comments and feedback have been have been reviewed and, and something's happened. Uh, it's really about saying when an assessment occurs, the people that are on the floor are, are watching what's actually happening. They're talking to consumers about how they've experienced and what happens with them. And I think that there's tools and resources available to assessors um, to, to be able to do that. We've certainly in health uh, mandated that the length of time that's spent out in the floor is much greater now than it ever used to be. And, and they're talking to the people delivering care, the people that receive care, um, and, uh, and using that as information to make a decision about whether the care is adequate. And sort of related to that question, a number of queries have been coming through about older people and how they're going to be engaged in the assessment, particularly older people that might be in residential aged care services, less able to communicate what their experience might be. Josh, do you want to talk to that one? I'm sorry, can I just get you to run through that again? Um, so one of the comments coming through is how how will we engage older people in the audits by the by the commission, sure. particularly where they might have communication challenges or difficulties? How do we ensure that their experience is also captured in the assessment of the provider? That's a really good question, um, and I think it's about ensuring that you know, particularly where there are you know issues where you know, say you may have a particular cultural, like a Greek centre or something like that. I think you do need to have translators available to help in those sorts of things. Having family members present as well, but again, it's the provider having staff who are responsible for the day-to-day -day engagement too, helping to, to support people is really important in that process. And then I think it's also about the looking at the other information that's feeding into that process more broadly. So again, the independent consumer experience interviews, where people feel really safe because it is a completely impartial workforce and how that can feed into the process as well. And related to that, another query is about how the National Quality Indicators will look into all of this. Do you also want to speak to that one? Yeah, absolutely happy to. So as you're all aware, so from April next year, there will be new consumer experience and, and quality of life indicators. And, and that's because we know that providers seek consumer feedback already through a range of different mechanisms. But this actually provides an opportunity to do it in a way that's standardised, standardised sorry, and based on um, best practice and evidence-based tools. And again, that will be a really useful mechanism to the providers, the collection of that data. Firstly, it will be important for the provider, first and foremost, to engage in that from a continuous improvement perspective. But again, that information will also feed into the regulatory processes of the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. And certainly from a policy perspective, we're interested as well. Now, we're getting a number of questions coming through specifically about the role of the Aged Care Commission around the qualifications of assessors, around the pilot, around the detail of that. I think we probably won't go into those questions now because really our focus is around the draft revised standards and we want to talk through that, but there will be opportunity down the track as the standards become more settled and as the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission is developing up the pilot and there'll be further opportunity for consultation around that and around the guidance that goes with that. I will just confirm for those who might have been joining a little bit late or who have it, who queried it in the chat that the PowerPoints will be made available, that this webinar will be made available on their website um, and that if uh, it, it's problematic for people to, to hear the webinar, we'll look at re-recording the, the session if need be. I think... I think most of the other questions that are coming up here, Josh, you're likely to cover off in the next session around the detail of the standards. One final question, though, regarding the applicability of the standards. So we've talked about um, the standards and their intersection for multi purpose services, but transition care, whether the standards will apply to transition care. Yeah, so my understanding is that certainly as a... Um it would be applying, and that's the current thinking. But Simon, are you happy to comment on that? Uh, only just to add, Josh, I think um, um, 
my expectation is yes, um, but again, the registration categories are still being worked through as part of the, um, the consultation process under the, the new model for regulating aged care. So I um, really encourage people on the webinar today to engage in that process to, to make sure the department's got the mix right of you know, services within registration categories and, and how it's been proposed that the standards will apply. Um, that's really the, the opportunity to, to engage in that. Thank you. All right, I'll sit down now, have a look back over the questions and see if we've missed any to return to. But then in the meantime, I'll hand back over to Josh and Margaret to run through some of the detail of the standards. Lovely, thank you, Andrea. And I'm hoping that the, the sound issues are improving. Um, but having said that, we will record another session um, if we have to. So standard one, let's get right into the details because I know this is where a lot of your questions are going. So standard one underpins the way that providers and workers are expected to treat older people. It has a through line across all the other standards. It reflects important concepts about dignity and respect older person individuality and diversity, independence, choice and control, culturally safe care and dignity of risk. And we know these are absolutely critical in fostering a sense of safety, autonomy, inclusion and well-being for older people. Older people are valuable members of society with rich and varied histories, characteristics and life experience. And so if there's one key that I would really like to emphasise following this next session, it's that a person's diversity does not define who they are, but it's critical that providers recognise and embrace each provider's, each person's diversity and identity, again, because they're holistically a person. And this has to drive responsive care, care delivery. And so engaging with people to better understand them and deliver care and services in line with this is absolutely at the heart of the new set of standards. In terms of the key changes, so this standard is similar to the current standard one, which does have that focus on the, uh, the older person. It retains many existing concepts, including valuing individual cultural and diversity, respecting privacy, and providing current, accurate and timely information. However, it also operates to strengthen the focus on some key areas. So this includes person-centred care, culturally safe care, trauma-aware and healing-informed care, decision-making and dignity of risk. So if we move through to the second standard, this is about the organisation. So it has outcomes and actions about organisational governance and culture, including quality systems to manage risks, incidents, complaints, information and humans, human resourcing. So aged care providers we know need to be well led. The intent of standard two is to hold the governing body responsible for meeting requirements of the quality standards and delivering safe and quality care and services. The governing body sets the strategic priorities for the organisation and it needs to actively engage in and drive a culture of safety, quality and continuous improvement. How it needs to do this is by engaging with older people, their carers and families, workers, and looking at the data on quality, such as quality indicators. So, standard two draws on standards six, seven, and eight from the current standards. And whilst it retains many of these concepts, it also includes requirements about supporting older people to make complaints, responding to complaints, open disclosure and using complaints to inform improvements. Again, we really want to encourage providers to create a positive reporting culture. It also strengthens the focus on some concepts. So again, partnering with older people to inform care and services, quality and safety culture, accountability and quality systems, workforce planning, as well as worker competency. So looking at training and support and monitoring of work, worker performance and in addition, emergency and disaster management. So if we move on to standard three, standard three is the care and the services. And it includes requirements about assessment and planning, communicating information about an older person's care and services, and delivering care and services in line with their needs, goals, and preferences. We know that effective assessment and planning, communication, and coordination is critical. So standard three is intended to apply to providers regardless of the types of services they deliver. If 
For example, the requirements in Standard 3 would apply to providers delivering service types where additional standards apply, such as clinical care, food and nutrition, residential care. And we see these standards as complementary. Again, the standards have a through line across one another. In delivering care and services, providers and workers must draw on all the relevant standards. Again, in particular reference to Standard 1, including to ensure care is tailored to the individual and what's important to them. So Standard 3 draws on the current standards, Standards 2, parts of Standards 3, and parts of Standard 4. And so whilst it retains many of the concepts, again, including assessment and planning, it includes more detail about the, the, the requirements of matters to be captured in care plans and how care plans need to be used to inform care delivery. It also strengthens the focus on reablement and delivering care and services in a way that supports independence and quality of life, supporting people with dementia, and also communicating and care coordination. If we move through to standard four, standard four covers the environment. So this includes requirements about the physical environment in which the care and services are delivered, as well as infection prevention and control. So it includes requirements about the service environment that differ based on whether the care is delivered in an older person's home, a service environment such as day centres, respite centres, residential services, and again, not surprisingly, there is an emphasis on infection prevention and control. So implementing appropriate precautions to prevent and minimise transmissions, availability and use of PPE. The intent of Standard 4 is to ensure that older people receive care and services in a physical environment that is safe, supportive and meets their needs. Standard 4, as I said before, draws on parts of Standard 5 and Standard 3, retains many of the existing concepts, so things like having a safe, clean and well-maintained environment, a service environment that enables people to move freely, both indoors and outdoors, and fit-for-purpose equipment. It also strengthens the focus on some concepts, including environmental risk assessments in people's homes, and again, infection prevention and control. I'd now like to hand over to Margaret from the Australian Commission on Safety and Healthcare to take you through Standard 5. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Um, I pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on the lands on which we meet, and um, thank you for the opportunity. So, Standard 5, the clinical care standard, it's been developed to describe for providers what needs to be in place so that they can deliver high, good quality care, clinical care. This quality standard applies to providers delivering or responsible for that co coordinating clinical care, whether it's in the home or whether it's in a residential environment. H, uh, standard five addresses uh, those key safety and quality issues, including those raised by the Royal Commission, such as clinical governance, uh, infection control, medication safety, comprehensive care and end of life. There's also a focus in the standards on those things that the Royal Commission and, and consumers have told us are, are high risk, high occurring uh, areas of, of harm, such as falls, pressure injuries, cognitive impairment and continence. The uh, clinical care standard describes the responsibilities the providers have um, for, uh, for the governance framework and how it's implemented and uh, it's monitored. The governing body of an organisation is responsible for ensuring that it's in place and that performance against that clinical governance framework is monitored. Many of the older people requiring clinical care are frail with comorbidities and complex care needs. These people may be frail, have limited mobility, experiencing cognitive impairment or be near the end of their life. At all times, the clinical care provided should be person-centred and address the older person's specific clinical needs and their preferences. Delivering safe, high-quality care requires a skilled workforce that really are supported in their role to deliver evidence-based care. 
The clinical care standard should not be implemented or reviewed in isolation, um, as many of the actions that are part of the non-clinical, the other standards one to seven, are relevant to ensuring evidence-based clinical care practice is delivered effectively. Um, implementing standard five is reliant on other standards. These systems and processes support clinical care. Um, they ensure that risks of harm to older people are minimised and support continuous quality improvement. So if we look at standard five, it draws on parts of uh, standard two, three and eight from the current quality standards. It retains many existing concepts, such as delivering care in line with a person's assessed needs, goals and preferences, implementing a clinical governance framework, antimicrobial stewardship, and delivering comprehensive care that's coordinated and multidisciplinary, and maximising dignity for people with near the end of their life. It strengthens the focus on some of the other concepts, including using a digital clinical information system to facilitate high quality care, using mechanism, mechanisms such as interoperability to ensure consistency and information. Uh, this can improve transitions of care and clinical care, for example, oral health care. We've added uh, medication safety and made clear what it is intended because this group of people are, are more likely to be taking uh, uh, multiple medications. Reducing and managing specific clinical risks is part of this standard, as is uh, a more specific requirement around infection control. So being very clear about what is, is needed in relation to infection control. And so back to you, Josh. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. So that's standard six. I think this one could be my favourite, food and nutrition. So as I said before, government's committed to improving food, nutrition, and also the dining experience for older Australians, and a dedicated food and nutrition standard is part of that approach. This standard is intended to apply for, de for providers delivering residential aged care. Food, drink and the dining experience can have a huge impact on a person's quality of life and also health outcomes. As people age, they may lose their appetite or experience conditions that impact on their ability to eat and drink. So engaging with older people is really critical to understand what and how they like to eat and drink, how to deliver choice and meals that are full of flavour, appetising, as well as nutritious, including texture modified diets. And we want to support older people as much as we can through this process to consume as much as they want. In many cultures, food also plays a really large role in fostering feelings of inclusion and belonging. So the experience of sharing food and drink with older people, friends and families is important for many older people. Providers must draw on standard three in delivering food services to ensure this is informed by that robust assessment and planning process we talked about before, and to ensure that these services are delivered in line with their needs, goals, and preferences of older people. It's also critical for providers to monitor older people for malnutrition and dehydration and respond appropriately where concerns are identified. And that's addressed in standard five, which uh, Margaret just spoke about. So standard six expands significantly on parts of standards two and four from the current quality standards. It substantially clarifies the requirements around food and nutrition. It includes requirements that menus need to be designed and regularly changed in partnership with older people, as well as chefs, cooks, and accredited practicing dietitians. It requires the assessment of nutritional needs and preferences, the need to provide appetising and nutritious food and drinks. Food needs to be both nutritious and delicious in order to be consumed. And it needs to provide a supportive and enjoyable dining environment. So we might move on to standard seven, residential community. So these are those requirements that are specific to residential care providers. Uh, and it's also around services and supports for daily living and transfers and care is one of the key focus. 
So when people move into a residential service, the residential community becomes a central feature of their lives. It's critical that older people feel safe at home in the residential community, have opportunities to do things that are meaningful to them, and then they're supported to maintain the connections with people that are important to them. Meaningful activities can include participation in hobbies, community groups, seeing friends, families, or activities that contribute to the residential community. Things that we've heard that residents want to be able to do are things like gardening, cooking, even setting tables. Residential communities can involve diverse members from different cultures and backgrounds. So again, this is that point we spoke about before, that it's really important that each older person's culture is respected and the diversity valued so they feel safe, clued, and at home in the service. Additionally, in residential aged care, it's critical to ensure that older people have access to other services and any transitions are planned and coordinated to maximise the continuity of care for older Australians. So again, Standard 7 draws on parts of Standards 3 and 4 from the current quality standards and retains some of these existing concepts to support people to participate in activities that promote their emotional, spiritual, psychological well-being and have social and personal relationships. However, it provides improved clarity on the need to minimise boredom and loneliness, support people to contribute to their community, protect psychological safety, transition people to and from the service, and have connections with specialist dementia care services. So now it's time for our second, second question and answer session. So please enter your questions about the content of each of the quality standards. And um, over to you, Andrea, to facilitate. I might just start with a few general comments that have been coming through that I'm confident everyone on the panel would agree with. But we've had some good comments coming through from people confirming that we need to focus on holistic care, that the Royal Commission was all about holistic care, not just task-driven or compliance-oriented care. Two, the importance of cultural safety, but it being meaningful, not just about people doing cultural awareness training and therefore feeling like they've got that covered, but it actually needing to be safe and responsive, particularly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. A third point was some strong support for the reference to trauma-informed care, but it's important for all staff, including staff in people's homes. And some comments around general agreement with the standards and the standards being a nice piece of work, but the workforce issues being so challenging in the current contexts, in the current context. Josh, do you just want to touch on that one briefly in terms of some of the other supports and things that are happening around workforce more broadly around reform? And then we can move back into the detail at the standards? Absolutely. So one of the things that we always talk about from an aged care quality perspective, and this is something that I want to recognise with, with both providers and consumers, is that there's two key inputs to quality. That is funding, and that is also the aged care workforce. Um, and there's a range of initiatives um, that we're pursuing in that place. Um, in a quality perspective, from a quality perspective, something we heard from consumers around the value of relationships with workers, having authentic relationships and, and not increased turnover. And that's one of the reasons why we have a workforce quality indicator. But I want to say that we're aware of that. We're working on the workforce initiatives with you um, and that that's something we need to work together to, to achieve a better outcome to ensure quality aged care services. And before we move to the questions on the standards, I might just remind people as well, if they're looking online with some of the documents, that there's two documents or there's a number of documents online. One that is a summary version of the standards and another that is the full version. So I think some of the questions people are asking might mean that they're looking at the summary version rather than the full version. The first question around the standards is to you, Margaret. So people have been commenting on the topics in that comprehensive care, one around kind of continence, mobility, hydration. Could you give us a bit of a sense of how some of those topics were selected and, and the focus on, on particular areas of care? Sure. So um, whenever you select something that goes into uh, a set of standards, they have to be something that is particularly a safety and quality issue into a safety and quality set of standards. So it has to occur frequently. So we haven't got things in there that are one-offs. Um, it has to be something that causes harm or can, has a high risk of causing harm. 
It has to be something that we know has evidence base that sits underneath it so that we can make improvements because it's no good having something in there that there's no basis on which to make improvement. We need to know that, that, that we can do better and so there's opportunities for actually making a difference and, have, and making improvement. We also selected, and these areas are, are really very easy to identify, falls, pressure injuries, infections. These are the things that people see day to day, um, it, both in where the care is delivered. Um, other, other topics came from the Royal Commission because it was evident to them after you know two years of research that these are areas that needed to be covered. So it, as a result, we've got continence, uh, oral health, we've got food and nutrition, we've got other areas that come in because um, medication safety is in one. Um, they're areas that we know we have risks of harm and when that harm occurs, it occurs to either a lot of people or the harm is catastrophic and we don't want that to occur. Thank you. Josh, because it is your favourite subject, you're going to get the questions on food and nutrition, of which we've had a few there. The first question is around why is the food and nutrition standard specific to residential care and not also home care? Care to Absolutely. I think in the context of home care, there's still uh, an emphasis on people having control over that environment, um, as distinct from having to rely 24-7 on your nutritional and hydration requirements from a provider. So there are requirements that are there in the care and services that I think still lend itself to tumult times. But it's also in the context of home care, we do want to see a focus on engagement too. So empowering with people, working with them to get them in the kitchen and being self-sufficient. But noting there will be a night time where we do need to step in with pre-prepared meals. And on that one also around food nutrition, just confirmation that it is going to apply to, that standard six food nutrition will apply to cottage respite. Yes. Yeah, as a residential yes. service environment. Yeah. Okay. We've also had some queries around um, financial management and governance, a suggestion that there might be a gap around financial management and governance. Obviously, there's kind of standard two around the organisation that is really around governance, but there's other requirements that government has already announced that form part of other provider obligations. Simon, do you want to talk briefly about kind of how the standards might intersect with some of the other provider obligations that would continue to exist, including some of those that have already taken effect or soon to around governance. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So there's absolutely a, another piece of work that's going to the sort of the prudential um, financial management, and there will be some further work that comes out to talk to that specifically. So they will be. Um, so it's a really good question, and it's really well picked up. It is there's no financial management um, uh, element to the governance standard as such, which people might expect, and that's because there's a particular reform um, process underway around the prudential oversight and um, uh, with the um, the HK Quality and Safety Commission, while well, um, going forward, have the ownership of setting those particular standards, and that will be then operationalised um, uh, by the commission processes. Uh, there is also, um, as, as many people on the webinar today would be aware, there's the other governance reforms that are um, due to commence shortly, and there'll be further information coming out in relation to those. Um, you know, having said that, how that then is incorporated into the new Act is still part of the reform approach going forward and making sure that these all uh, interrelate and operate um, seamlessly as a, as a package of expectations for providers. And another comment I should have picked up to share with you at the beginning, uh, there's been a few comments around carers and the important role of carers and making sure that in the new age Campbell we do have proper recognition of carers, not just um, in terms of their role but also their contribution to assessments, assessing providers against the standards because often they'll have intimate knowledge that others may not. So. Yeah, so the, um, absolutely. Um, carers are part of what we refer to as and or their representatives, uh, the older person. So um, uh, apologies if we're not clear about that. We, we kind of um, jump into um, our uh, everyday speak, but it's uh, absolutely the older person and old Australian and their representatives are a 
are part of the same uh, group that we would uh, expect to be engaged in in that um, you know that process of um, having the conversation around the you know the quality of um, services or supports that uh, individuals are um, receiving, and it's um, clearly afternoon that time. <laughs> One second. And Josh, there's been a few comments in the chat around holistic, being able to understand the holistic needs of the person, including the sexual needs of the person being kind of part of kind of primary a primary need. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about how the standards are expressly calling out older people's right to sexual intimacy and those things that are kind of bigger than just clinical care and other needs? Absolutely, I think it's a really good, you know, a really good point um, that as we age, those particular needs that motivate us, they can change, but not necessarily. There's certainly, you know, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, things like food, shelter, things like sex are really critical, and that shouldn't change, particularly as people move from home care and into residential aged care. People should be able to choose to engage in sexual, re or, you know, sexual relationships um, of their own choice. Consent's key to this, but I think it's really important that if we do call it out, it is 2022, um, and I'm really interested in people's views on that through the consultation. We've had a few questions about the application of some of the standards, particularly standard four around service environment. The first question there, I'll go to you again, Josh, um, but the question has been from our health professionals. So would it be considered a service environment where a person might go to an office or a clinic to receive allied health care? If they're not the particular aged care service, my understanding is that we are regulating that service environment, but what we would look to is ensure continuity in care and the effective transition between the services. Um, so that's something that I'd be interested in hearing about from consultation. But Simon, did you have a view on that? Um, I think it is um, encompassing the types of services supports that people are receiving. So I, mean, I agree um, with your comments, Josh. It will depend very much as to the service setting where it's been delivered because we, we're, we're not effectively regulating into um, every environment so exactly. much more where it's um, uh, it, it's coming into the setting um, of the of the of the older person if you like. And certainly currently where we talk about the service setting or the service environment with the standards, we focus really on those venues where day therapy is being provided or where men's sheds or where Absolutely. services are being delivered to multiple um, multiple older people or in groups. Mm -hmm. But as the new um, home support program is being developed, we'll also have to look at how it works, particularly in those types of scenarios. Andrew, can I just pick yeah. up on that holistic care um, mm. question we had a little earlier? And um, I just wanted to add in the sort of the spiritual dimension to it. Like there's a number of references within the standards that go to, and just for people's um, note, there's uh, 1.1, 5.5.3, um, 7.1.1. So just, again, to highlight how the mm. standards will interact with each other and, and reinforce some concepts um, in, in the particular um, part of the standards that they relate to. So the first is the person, the second is the clinical standard, and, and um, the, the third being standard seven being the, the, um, the residential community. Mm. So they all work um, to reinforce those concepts that are across each of the standards. Margaret, we've got a specific question here around the clinical care standards, standard five. Mm -hmm. Can you please explain what you mean by in 5.1.3? working towards implementing a clinical information system that integrates with nationally agreed electronic health and aged care digital records interoperability, that one, of different systems. Sure. Uh, so uh, a key national priority has been the development of My Health Record. My Health Record provides an opportunity for a consumer to have their information shared across multiple different providers in the health system, um, in, uh, in aged care, in, other, in disability. Um, it's an opportunity for information to go to providers so that we don't lose information, so there's effective clinical handover. And so the idea is those organisations that are putting in my health record or submitting information to my health record, do it in a way that is consistent with national, uh, nationally agreed terms, identifiers. 
So it is saying that this offers you an opportunity to um, access information and for consumers to be able to manage their information. And having done that, though, we need to make sure that you use it in a way that's agreed so that the information is available, not corrupted, you know, fully readable, legible in, in that document. So that's what's intended, so that we want you to use it. And if you're using it, these are the rules. Um, but it isn't saying that this has to be done immediately, that we know that these a gradual period of picking it up, but nationally we've all agreed that this is something that should happen and should be available and people should be able to see their health record. Thank you. All right, a question here, Josh, around the intersection with the quality principles, particularly around restrictive practices. So the standards obviously don't go into detail around restrictive practices and serious incident response scheme. Do you want to talk a little bit about the intersection between the standards and those other obligations around restrictive practice? Yeah, absolutely. So we, there would continue to be um, in a future state with the new Act and new legislation specific obligations. So I can think, you know, restrictive practices is a really good example, as well as also the um, serious incident response obligations. I think the quality standards sit slightly separate to that, and it's looking more broadly at the, the broader systems, the processes you have in place, what you're doing from a quality management perspective, a clinical governance perspective, and those sorts of things. But they actually do have line of sight to one another. So to have an effective incident management system, you could certainly look at what it says in relation to serious, the serious incident response scheme. Uh, again, when we talk about you know, you know, providing person-centered and appropriate good quality care uh, in the context of restrictive practices, those principles and those requirements do need to be applied if they're applicable to a particular person. A couple of other questions that have just come through relate to, it, it's sort of around the assessment, but it's really around the expectations of the department around standards related to dignity of risk. So agreement that dignity of risk is really important and it needs to be encouraged, but concern that where providers might look at particular risks with older people and agree, and you know, that they kind of partner to enable that to happen for the person, that they then might find themselves in trouble with the regulator when the regulator might take a different view of risk. Do you have thoughts, Josh, on how we ensure that we kind of deliver the policy intent around ensuring dignity of risk for older Australians? Absolutely. So to me, dignity of risk is absolutely critical to having a person-centred system and putting consumers at the centre of the system. We all take risk in our day-to-day -day lives and, and as you move through the continuum of, of aged care, that shouldn't change. To me, it's about having really good communication between the providers and staff um, and older Australians. It's where a particular risk wants to be taken, that there's been a conversation about it, the risk noted, document it from a provider perspective. If you can be transparent about the risk and show that you had the conversation, um, but a person chose to do a particular thing anyway, that's the intent of what we're trying to set up here. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Simon? Just to um, highlight that, you know, where dignity of risk um, isn't supported, that, you know, um, overproactive practices can negatively impact those individuals um, and, you know, they can disengage, feel that the hope's removed because they can't undertake what would have been a normal practice in their lives before um, receiving care. So, uh, look, it is really important to get that balance right and, and I would, as Josh said, um, encourage um, providers who are um, having some you know, difficulties in presenting that is to really, um, you know, seek the views of the, the older Australian that they're supporting to be able to represent that to the Commission to, to be really clear about why, um, you know, you're uh, facilitating what may appear at first glance to be a risky type behaviour. There's a few questions coming through, Josh, around the broader supported home reform and around the broader reform. I might just touch on a couple of those because I think you'll be able sure. to answer those in any event sure. and then we'll come back to the standards. Um, the question is, noting that care coordination is a new service, will consumers be able to select which provider provides that service for them? Again, that's something that's been an active consideration in future reforms, i.e. who has responsibility for that over coordination piece and is there a specific role assigned to that? Um, and I think there's been pros and cons and a number of options floating around it. To me, 
the, the aged care quality standards is future-proofed against the scenario either way. But what I would say is that there's a responsibility amongst all service types to be talking to one another because that's how you truly wrap the care and services around a person. Um, and so it, irrespective of having someone responsible for the overall role of, of, of coordinator, if you like, there still is always going to be that, that role of communicating at a service level between other service types. There's not a lot of questions coming through on the clinical care standard, Margaret, so I'm not ignoring you, but we'll come back around to those as more come through. Simon, a question's come through here on standard four, the environment, where we talk about equipment provided by the provider is safe, clean, well-maintained and meets the needs of older people. The question is, does this leave the door open to second-hand items or providers not providing new items to consumers in their homes? Ah, that's a really good question. Um, uh, look, I think what we are trying to manage there is the risk of um, substandard equipment, how it's sourced, um, and if it's in good working order, I mean, obviously that's still, there'll be a level of guidance that will come to support those um, expectations. But what we're really trying to manage there is that risk of substandard equipment being utilised, which has poor outcomes, so poor hoist, et cetera, that aren't able to hold the weight of the particular individual, for instance, that um, leads to a, a, a poor outcome for that, um, the, for that particular individual. And I think it's acknowledging like you say, that there's some items that'll be single use items, there's some items that must be new, there'll be yeah. other items that a provider might come in and be using regularly with different consumers. And so that brings in the infection prevention. Actually, Margaret, do you want to talk a little bit more about the strengthening of the requirements around infection prevention and control and their proposed application across the board, not just in relation to residential care, but also care in the home? Uh, yeah, look, infection prevention controls has come front of mind as a result of the pandemic and even the national standards for health services, we've had to go back and have a look at them because uh, it's brought to our attention some gaps that we had. It was, it, we would be remiss if we didn't uh, try and address those gaps in this set of standards. So what we've tried to do is be clear about the areas that we've identified as risks. So things like um, training and support for the workforce to use PPE, um, infection uh, immunisation programs, not working when you're unwell, and looking at and planning for those things like pandemics um, and, and novel viruses that are really going to make a difference to the to the um, well-being of people that are living in in residential home in residential care, but recognising that the transmission of, of infections is something uh, that can happen at any location and from the consumer to the to the carer and back again. So it's about making sure that everybody's protected in this uh, in, in this setting. And while you're speaking, the clinical care questions are coming in thick and fast uh -huh. now. <laughs> but I've prompted that one. Um, so another kind of question is around, and maybe um, you can talk more broadly to this one as well, but the question is really around how holistically, as part of clinical care, providers will integrate the person's cultural and spiritual needs. So not just in the other types of care that they're delivering, but also in the clinical care. Do you even want to talk more broadly about how the standards will kind of layer and the expectations of standards one to four being equally applicable to standard five? It's not just that they're equally applicable, it's that they need to be put in place in, in and implemented at the same time. They're integrated, they rely on each other. Um, and so you can't have an effective clinical care system without an effective governance or partner with consumers component of that. So, so while we have written things about infection control generally uh, across the standards, they're very specific about those places where the risk is higher and you're providing clinical care. So for us, implementing the clinical care standard is entirely reliant on each of the other standards and them being in place and working effectively so that uh, clinical care can be provided. And Josh, linked to, I know we um, had a question a little bit earlier around kind of the intersection with the supported home um, program, but another, a few comments here are really kind of people looking for reassurance that with the new program, but also with the new standards, that older people will continue to be supported to self-manage where they choose to do that, and that the standards won't undermine that intent. I would completely agree that that's the policy intent. 
So, yeah, I would support that. Yeah, that we want to be able that to see want, people so We want to enable that in every scenario that we can, correct? Where it's the person's choice. Yeah. Another kind of theme that I guess is coming through a few of the questions, which kind of links back to the dignity of risk question that came up earlier, is around innovation and making sure we're continuing to encourage innovation. And maybe um, to any of you, your reflections on how the standards were developed with that kind of mind to making sure that they aren't so prescriptive that they do stifle innovation. Because I know that was a key motivator coming out of the Royal Commission and as we've been developing the standards, wanting to make sure that they don't do that. Learning from any thing that we're, we've got a failure or a near miss is an opportunity for you to look at how your systems are working and how they can be changed. Um, supporting your workforce and giving them the opportunity to provide feedback and for consumers to provide feedback is a mechanism which you can then use. The learning, the innovation and the learning environment for an organisation comes from taking that really rich source of, of learnings and doing something with it. So making your governing body responsible for safety and quality, giving your, your management the authority and the expectation that they will put it in place and then supporting the, the workforce to be able to achieve it all supports innovation and learning and, and better quality care. And that's a lovely segue as well to a comment that another person's made online, that it's not just about the providers kind of innovating and evaluating, no, it's, it's but also governments reviewing the standards and evaluation being critical to the standards working and continuing to be fit for purpose over time. I think, Simon, you were about to say something yeah, earlier I, around innovation. I, I was, actually. Thanks, Andrea. Um, look, I think when um, people get the chance to uh, digest uh, the standards, and as Josh has sort of spoken to earlier in the presentation, the structure we've changed to, to an extent to really um, not limit the, that level of innovation in our outcome statement. So when we then drop down to our actions, what we've so which is the what the outcome statement that you'll be assessed against, but those um, actions are really. Uh, proportionately applied to the how. So we're not being so prescriptive to say we want to see, you know, um, policy A on shelf X. We're really talking about what we want in the how. You might demonstrate, a, you know, a workforce strategy and um, some of the things it might include. Um, however, that's then described or represented in evidence is completely where a provider can innovate to, to make that, um, you know, to demonstrate that outcome mm -hmm. in the standard. So we've been really keen to not, you know, um, limit innovation in the market. A couple more clinical care questions for you, Margaret. One about what the standards are doing or the provider responsibilities more broadly to protect individuals from over-administration of medications. So how we address over-prescribing of medications, particularly in residential care. And look, there's a lot of different, it's not just the clinical care standard, but other standards as well, recognising um, the person's rights, so seeking their feedback. Also looking at them holistically, um, and if you've got somebody who's very drowsy, who seems to be taking a large number of medications, they're looking at uh, the quality use of medicines, which is the structure on which the medication standard is part of that is, is shaped. It also looks at medication reviews, so that people with multiple medications should regularly undergo some sort of review of their medicines to make sure that they're all still needed, they're still all appropriate, that they've not duplicated. Certainly at critical points, like um, if they've been to a, 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 into a hospital and returned, um, if they've had a medical appointment and there's likely to have been change, there's the opportunity then to review. So there's lots of different points, but it's based on the quality use of medicines framework. And, and that is the way that we've structured it so that, that uh, in setting up those systems, then, then those issues about polypharmacy and polypharmacy causing harm mm. are, are, are identified and recognised as a risk for an individual and, and then somebody's doing something, taking action. And I know the department's also done some recent consultation on the on-site pharmacists and their role in that body use of medicines. Yep, yeah. The second question for you was around um, 
falls assessment and pain assessment following falls and how we ensure that those pain assessments are undertaken by appropriately qualified people acting within their scope of practice. So some concern that the pain assessments might be done by people who might not be qualified to do that. And so pain being not properly identified and managed. Look, as a pro appropriately qualified workforce is, is a fundamental part of implementing the clinical care standard. But those people that are in the workforce, and you know, organisations can train. They can also look at who's who is likely to do these assessments, and how do they make sure that those people have sufficient skills and qualifications to be able to do that. So um, it is making sure that uh, you have the skills. The people that you need to have on and available have got skills and you've got enough of them to be able to do the work that's, that's needed. And I don't think that's an easy answer, but mm. yes, it, it is an important component and they do need to have the this, this skills to be able to have the scope of practice to be able to do that. Yeah. A couple of questions, particularly around the, the older person, around um, how we avoid a situation where... Well, the question is, surely a facility isn't there to change the habits of a lifetime of an older person. They want to eat what they want to eat. If they want to smoke, they want to be able to smoke. If they commence doing that at 15, why should the service try and change them? Josh, do you want to comment on that? On that? So, like, if we're talking about residential aged care, um, I don't disagree with that statement as long as it's not impacting on other residents. So the smoking thing, as long as people have an area to go and smoke and other people can, you know, not have to be... Um, taking in passively that, that, that secondhand smoke in relation to food, I completely agree with you too, which is why I think we need to work in designing menus which offer choices which are both nutritious and delicious. You should be able to choose a, pal a calorie packed hamburger if you like, which is not a bad thing because it's full of calories and protein which older people need. But I agree entirely. I think this is why you do, you're do you working um, to design those services in line with people's preferences, um, but not at the expense of other residents. And, and related to that very much is how do we make sure um, that people's spiritual needs are met, but more specifically, how do we measure that? Um, so to me, we've put a greater emphasis on spiritual needs. I think it's really key in, in terms of providing person-centred care and understanding someone holistically. Um, in terms of how you measure it, I'd be asking people. Um, do you feel like your needs are being met? Are you being, you know, are you enabled to, you know, are you facilitating access, access to those sorts of things? To me, it's asking the person. Can I just add that? I think Josh is 100% right. It's the, the experience of the individual, but it's also, you know, um, the access to the individual. So in the residential community, we, we have a, um, a hook there, if you like, uh, of the provider supports and enables older people to do the things they want to do, including to participate in activities that promote their emotional, spiritual and psychological well-being. So really, you're then saying, is that being operationalised for individual A in their care plan and, and therefore you've got something that's accessible? So um, we, we have been really keen to, to try and hit both of those domains. And that's one of the things we're really keen to get from people as part of the feedback on the standards is where they think um, they are too uncertain or wouldn't readily be able to be evidenced, how what might we strengthen them to ensure that they are well understood and readily able to be evidenced. One of the questions that's come up here, Josh, is around the challenges with the current standards in relation to substitute decision making where we can, where sometimes the substitute decision makers' views might not align with that of the older person themselves and we can end up with conflict. Mm -hmm. But the question is really, is there anything kind of within the standards or reform more broadly that is more about kind of supportive decision making and supporting older people to make decisions rather than the kind of more binary substitute decision making it's a really good question. So they are looking at it in the context of the broader Aged Care Act. So I'm sure have, you know, in order to have a human rights-based person-centred act, um, teasing out that issue. And obviously some of the interplays there that we have between Commonwealth requirements and differing state and territory requirements as well. It's an issue that we're thinking about and welcome people's thoughts because we know providers have to deal with this day to day um, and it's actually a really intractable problem that we need to deal with in the context of a new system. 
I don't know that we'll deal with it in the quality standards as such, but we'll look to future-proof the quality standards with any broader changes we made in, made in the new Aged Care Act. I think that's kind of most of the main issues that have been coming up so far. Simon, I think you're up next with kind of next steps from here, but then we'll have an opportunity for some further questions. If we haven't answered some specific questions that people see answered, we'll have some more time. Thanks, Andrea, and thanks everyone for your time today. Um, public consultation to test the quality standards and see if they meet the community's expectation is now officially started. They started today. Uh, consultation will run for six weeks until the 25th of November and includes a range of ways for you to provide feedback. We are encouraging as many people as possible to get involved and have their say because, as we all know, aged care quality aged care matters. This includes older Australians, their families, friends and carers. Excuse me. Oops, technical echo. It also includes, of course, the aged care sector, including providers, workers and clinicians. After today's webinar, we are running a series of online focus groups on each standard and specific target areas. Target focus areas include home care, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander care, and rural and remote focus group. We have provided two series of focus groups, the first for older Australians, families and carers, and the second series for the aged care sector, including providers, workers, and clinicians. These sessions will be facilitated by Andrea, who you've met today, um, to support robust discussion and everyone having their say. You can find individual titles um, to each series of the focus groups on the Get Involved page of the Aged Care Engagement Hub, where you can register your interest, and this is via Eventbrite. Feedback will also be collected through online um, survey and paper surveys. Written submissions will be also accepted by the online survey, which um, is now available through the Engagement Hub. If you prefer to complete the survey in hard copy, you can request a copy to be mailed to you by the My Aged Care phone line. There is a range of materials available via the Aged Care Engagement Hub to support your participation in this consultation. Uh, this includes uh, a complete copy of the detailed draft strength and standards, a summary version of the draft strength and quality standards, and a consultation paper, sorry, consultation papers that describe the strength and quality standards, including the process and drivers for the changes, which we've touched on today. One consultation paper will be a shorter summary while a de more detailed version will be available for those who wishing to engage in more information. Uh, if you're a provider, pro promotional materials are available to promote the public consultation in your services, including posters and fact sheets that can be printed and um, displayed in your services to engage with, you know, to allow us to engage with your residents or, or others that you support. The valuable feedback from the public consultation will support the department to have clear insight into how we can ensure the strength and quality standards provide a framework to continue to deliver, to continue to support the delivery of high quality care to older Australians accessing all types of aged care services. Once consultation finishes, we will be analysing your feedback in order to make improvements to the quality standards and will then detail your feedback and improvements made in a report to the government late this year. Following this, probably in um, early next year, we'll also release uh, what we've heard in relation to your feedback and summarise that and publish it. Uh, as mentioned today, next year, the Aged Care Commission will be piloting the strength and quality standards and developing the guidance that sits the level beyond below the actions that we've talked to today, some of the actions um, at, to support the implementation of those standards. 
We'll also be working with our legislation team to include the strength and quality standards in the new Aged Care Act as subordinate instrument, um, which is where the standards will sit. Uh, and back over to you now, Josh. All right, thank you, Simon. That's the uh, that's the end of our, our presentation. Um, we've reached our third and final question and answer session. So I might just check in. Andrew, have we got some outstanding questions? Oh, we, we, might, be able to, we might be able to answer. Yep, Lovely. I'll invite you up to the, uh, the lectern one more time. All right. We have a flurry of questions there. So I might just try to group them a little bit. Starting with kind of the topic of that session around next steps and future consultation, could we just please confirm the closing date for submissions? Uh, the 25th of November. The next question around it was noting that a number of the focus groups are full and are being waitlisted, will there be another kind of larger forum that people can participate in with the other focus groups? Yeah, we will be um, adding some more focus groups to um, for the overflow of the um, ones that have gone to waitlist now, which is why we've created the waitlist system so that we could manage which sessions we're filling up and then stand up extra uh, capacity. So we'll be doing that in the coming days. And so if you're on a waitlist, you'll get some notification um, of, of new session dates. And linking, related to that, but linking back to some of the things that you mentioned earlier, Josh, about when guidance would be made available and when there might be more information about mapping against the standards, intersections with other sets of standards, all of that type of information that will be really valuable to providers. Absolutely. So what we'll be doing is finalising the set of standards and urgent review towards the end of next year. When we kick off with a, a pilot of the, the new standards with the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, I think that's where we'll have greater input, greater feedback from providers, really know the areas we need to focus on from a guidance perspective, not only from consultation, but the pilot itself. And so we'll work to, de we'll work to develop those in conjunction with the sector. So it's something, again, that we, we would like your input to as much as we can. So stay in touch for, for next year as well, we'll say to that. And then we had a number of questions. Some of them we answered earlier, but it might just be worth going back over, Josh, mm -hmm. around the application of the standard, sure. around whether the standards would apply to CHSP providers. Absolutely. So it's um, it's envisaged that it's, it's it's around the type of service that's being provided. There are some policy decisions that need to be make uh, made um, as to what the what the new support at home care program looks like. But certainly, what we're thinking from a quality perspective is that the standard needs to be able to apl apply based on service type. So, for example, if providers only providing maintenance or gardening. We don't envisage that quality standards would apply. We think that they would be covered off by those other protections, such as code of conduct, worker registration and the like. Then the other types of standards, you can see how one to four um, could be universally applied to, to the majority of aged care services. And again, there's, the, there's those additional um, ones that apply to residential aged care or clinical care services, standard five. So, and related to that flexible care, so we've talked about the fact that for multi-purpose services, they continue to be subject to the health standards as they are currently, but do you want to just touch on again um, transition care, national average and trust are under flexible aged care program? So our thinking at this particular stage is that yes, they would apply um, and happy to hear how, from people in the feedback as to how they think that that does apply or whether or not people think there's more nuances in it. So happy to receive that feedback during consultation. And then there was also a question about whether they would apply to the aged care assessment teams. And so while the standards wouldn't, I think the reassurance is that I think the department's looking at what kind of codes of conduct, what might apply to workforce working for the department undertaking assessments. Look, it's a, it's, a really good, it's a really good point. So what you'll find is that a lot of those expectations are built into the assessment workforce, not through the aged care quality standards as such, but through contract mechanisms and the like. Good question. A couple of questions relating to the older person and their voice in all of this. One of the questions was, what do we do as an older person if we don't think the standards are being followed in the residential aged care service or by the, our provider in our home? 
I think that's a good, like that's a really good question. And, and my advice would be where possible, if you feel comfortable in doing so, raise that, raise it with your provider because generally what we find is the easiest way to find fast and um, sustainable resolution is having those early conversations. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable raising it um, as an older Australian, if you don't have a family member or representative to, to help you, we certainly have an advocacy program where you can get that additional support through an advocate. Having said that, there's also the, the next step, if you like, where you can raise a concern with the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. You can certainly do so um, with due confidence just to sound out what your issue is and, and get some advice there. But there, that's, the, that's the advice I would provide. And then a follow-up question to that was, how do we know we want to be treated badly when we raise issues? Yeah, good question. So again, I think... Um, I think the majority of providers would actually recognise that, you know, feedback is part of continuous improvement. Certainly in what we're trying to do from a, um, a quality standards perspective is build in that culture. And what I describe is whether you call it a positive um, reporting culture, but describe a culture where people feel safe to bring complaints to them. And I can say from a provider perspective, I'd rather older Australians raise the concerns with me so I can address it rather than having to get the regulator involved. Because at the end of the day, providers are there to provide you with quality aged care services. We've got a few more questions on a bit more of the detail of the standards. Um, and one in particular for you, Margaret, around the clinical care standard. And the question is around dignity of risk and end of life care and whether the voluntary assisted dying legislation had been taken into account in the development of the standards. And that's about um, uh, consumer choice um, and, and that is different to end of life care. End of life care is where a person is at their end of, uh, end of their life, that they're, they're given uh, opportunities to make decisions about how they want those last few days to be. Whether they die or not is, is already enshrined in legislation and, and good end of life care uh, may support that, but it, it, isn't, it isn't making the decision. They're two different pieces of work um, and one's about a choice and the other one's about providing good quality care. But certainly that question has come up during our, sure. our focus discussions around the clinical care standard and others and would also be addressed in, in guidance. Yeah, yeah. Another question around some of the detail. Someone's noted in the chat that currently you can have non-compliance against a standard on the experience of one consumer. Right, and at the moment that's reasonable because in some circumstances, you know, unnecessary restraint of one person might give rise to non-compliance, but in other circumstances, it might be the collective experience of many that gives rise to non-compliance. People have commented that we've removed that language of each in the current standards, but whether there's an expectation that the practice of assessment would change or stay the same, Josh. I think it depends on the circumstances, I'd have to say. So I think it depends on the severity of an event that may have occurred and what remedial action has been taken um, in relation to the follow-up. So without having specific examples, it's probably it's probably hard to give you a, a really considered view. Um, and, but again, um, we look forward to feedback on that. Um, if you've got particular experiences that you want to channel in the context of the current standards. Simon, do you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, thanks, Josh. I want to just add that, I, that we are absolutely, um, Recommendation 95 from the Royal Commission talked about graded assessments and uh, under understanding mm -hmm. the differentiated performance of providers. So we are, with the Commission, looking to explore and understand graded assessments so it's not a pass fail type approach in assessing standards which so you can understand if there's a minor um, non-conformance if you like or a major non-conformance whether there's conformity or there's elements of better practice evidence-based better practice so there's we are looking to differentiate that um you know that uh, expectation of how our providers met the, the standards so um which, which will take account of some of those singular instances and I, I probably just you know there's a, a lot of um, regulatory tools the regulator can use for specific instances as well so um you know and and that toolbox if you like is um is changing with the new aged care act and 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 so you know um some of the the, the previous approaches may be able to be nuanced to um, to 
to manage specific incident, incidents, if you like. And that was also answering another question that came through about um, whether we would be considering graded assessment and whether that could be incorporated in the pilot. There have been a number of questions around the pilot. We probably won't go into those in more detail except to note people's suggestions that have been around making sure we've got a good breadth of providers, making sure we, we look at regional areas and metro areas, making sure that we look at, at how the standards might apply in different contexts and um, questions about the graded assessment. But that's obviously all the next step. Yeah. I think just a couple more that are, are a little broader than the standards, Josh, but in important intersections with the standards. One has been around, particularly around the service environment, it's prompted people to ask questions around what's happening around respite options and having increased respite options available to people as part of kind of the broader reform agenda, which is about getting the right care to people at the right time. Do you want to comment on that briefly? So I know that's, that's something that's currently in train as we speak. So one of my colleagues, Nick Morgan, and his team are certainly looking at that issue, that how can we encourage and, and build up respite? I think, you know, firstly, that there certainly is um, there's the capacity within the system to take it. Um, and it's also a great way to keep, you know, care as a refresh, um, which is the thin wedge between people, you know, coming into more intensive care and services in the system. And so work is underway to, uh, I think, um, improve what can be offered in that space. And then just two more questions before I hand back over. One is around how broken services will be treated. So in the new world, how would service providers who broke up with others, how would the standards apply to those who are contracted to them and to the standard that providers doing the contracting? So I can, I can speak to that way in the first instance. And I know that this is something that we're talking about in the broader context of regulatory reform in any event. But if I, I take the principle that we have now is that a provider, whether or not you, you subcontract something that you're ultimately still responsible um, through those great arrangements for the delivery of care and services. Um, and so that's something that I'd leave people to think about. Is there anything you wanted to add on that, Simon? No, only to say that I think the new re the regulatory model going forward will be um, seeking to address those specific issues. And I think the final one was people looking for reassurance that there will be free education and training available through the Aged Care Safety Commission, through the department, for providers wanting to get across the new standards um, and workers also. Absolutely. I think that's really key to success. It's something that we heard, you know, really clearly again through the, the independent review that was run. Um, and so to me, it, it starts now, it starts by, you know, letting you know what we're thinking in terms of what a draft set of standards looks like, because this is making you aware and prepared that a change is coming. Um, to me, it's then building on that. It's, commu com you know, continuing to communicate with you throughout the pilot, letting you know what the learnings and those sorts of things are and then once we start to approach the, the point of legislation it's having the aged care quality safety and commission work with you really closely in developing the guidance that you need for that support government is committed to to an uplift in sector capability in order to meet the improved uh, accountabilities and so there has been um, greater investment across sector education we're working on initiatives in food, in food um, and also there is the, uh, the Assistant Commissioner for, for Sector Education and Capability, um, which will be focusing on that particular issue. If, if I could just add to that, just a bit of a plug for our survey. We, we are absolutely asking if there's particular supports that you think you need around um, certain standards and, and how um, to implement and, and operationalise, then we'd love to hear that as well. So there's a, a, an avenue to, to feed that into us, which we'll also be able to provide to our colleagues at the Commission in, as they prepare for their pilot and, and development of guidance. And that relates to a few more questions that have just literally come in in the last couple of seconds around kind of the alignment with the NDIS. So really that further work is being done on that also within the department about what the alignment look like, looks like. There's already been a consultation piece on regulatory alignment and that'll be continuing. So there'll be more information on all of that available to people. Yes. Yeah. All right, back over to you, Josh. Lovely. All right, just to give you the, the final thank you. So again, really appreciate your time for tuning um, here with us and asking some really 
really important questions. Uh, if you haven't already, please go to the, the Aging and Aged Care Hub to register for focus groups, download the revised quality standards and supporting consultations um, artifacts including the papers and please get in on and complete that survey in relation to those focus groups we do have those wait lists so where we do get enough of an increase in demand we absolutely plan on having the additional um, additional focus groups so you can have your say thanks again for your time thank you everyone and thanks team